chapter 8. We've made it to chapter 8, believe it or not. And chapter 8 kind of is a turning point. You know, everything in Romans so far, if you're a Christian, is encouraging, but it sounds pretty bad. I mean, you know, it, it, it talks about us not getting in the fight like we ought to. It talks about the struggles we have against sin. Roman, in, in, in chapter 8, we kind of make a little turning point. And there are some people who have said that Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in the Bible. Now, I don't know if it is or not. I, I, I personally think the one that's the greatest is the one I'm studying at the time. You know, it's like whatever I'm studying at the time, it has so much meaning to me. I think that's the best one. But I think they, there is a point to this when people say that Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in the Bible because it has to do with some things that ought to really make us happy, okay? Number one, it starts out with no condemnation. That ought to really make us happy right there, okay? It also talks about no separation from God. People ask me, you know, the... The worst people in the world, do they go to a hotter part of hell? You know, is there any levels of torture in hell? And I said, let me tell you what's going to be the worst torture in hell is being separated from God for eternity. And I said, if you're there, that means you're separated. But in Romans 8, he says, first of all, there is therefore now no condemnation, which means that there is no separation and there's no defeat. There's no defeat. He goes on. Now, believe me, this ain't going to be the only sermon you hear on Romans chapter 8. Because so I'm sitting here thinking, I could preach a whole sermon on no condemnation. I could preach one on no separation. Guess what? I'm already working on it. So get ready for them, okay? It's not the, it's not the last sermon. You, this, this uh, as college professors like to say, this is a survey sermon of, of, of Romans chapter 8. It kind of generally covers it. We're going to specifically cover it later on. Listen, Romans chapter 8 could be the greatest. I don't know that it is, but it could be the greatest because there are a lot of good things in it. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter this morning, but I do want you to stand and let's read the first four verses of chapter 8 because it really gives us a good idea of what the chapter is about. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Wow. There's that no condemnation and no separation, right? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Paul's talking to Christians right here. He's talking to Christians. He says that those who are in Christ Jesus they're not condemned anymore. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand your word. Send your Holy Spirit to interpret for us, Heavenly Father, so that we might understand and so that we might learn and that we might be encouraged and that we might live for you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I like the way Romans 8 starts out. It starts out with no condemnation. That's a good thing, folks. Listen, this is a statement that Paul was making of every Christian's eternal security in Christ. You know, there are debates and there are some denominations that don't believe in once saved, always saved. Amen. Let me tell you something. I believe, and I think Scripture backs this up, and I don't want to get off on this one too much, but listen. If you have a true experience with Jesus Christ and you ask Him to come into your heart and He does... Folks, nothing can separate you from that love ever again. Paul says it right here in Romans chapter 8. Amen. Nothing can separate you. What does the Bible say? What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Folks, that's one of those questions that people have absolutely no other answer to. You know, I love it when you ask somebody a question, uh, uh, some person a question, and they have to answer the correct way because there's no other answer. And, and I love how God does that. 
God sets it up, and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. There are five questions in, in Romans chapter 8 that God just asks and says, okay, give me an answer. And you know what? Pretty much there is either only one answer or there's no answer. And I love those. Nothing can separate us. He starts out with no condemnation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know what? We, we are a country of laws. We are set up under a system of laws. And that's not a bad thing, okay? I'm not knocking that at all. But you know what? If someone breaks the law, then they go in front of a, a, a jury of their peers and they're tried, right? And they are either acquitted, found not guilty, or they are condemned. One or the other. You know what? I'm thinking back. Y'all remember Jim Baker? Jim Baker was flying high. Jim Baker, millions, had that big resort up in Rock Hill, South Carolina, just below Charlotte, North Carolina. Let me tell you something. He was flying high. Problem was that he was stealing a bunch of money that people were sending to him. And guess what? He got caught. He got taken to court. He was tried and he was condemned to prison and paying fines. He was condemned. He could have gotten a maximum of 120 years in prison and up to $5 million in fines. You know, you think about other cases not having to do with quote-unquote Christians. Think about Ivan Boski. Y'all remember Ivan Boski? Ivan Boski was a trader in the New York Stock Exchange, and he got convicted, condemned of insider trading. And he was condemned to prisons and paying a bunch of fines. He was condemned. You go back, anybody remember who the Night Stalker was? Remember the Night Stalker crime? I don't know how many murders this guy, his name was Ramirez, Richard Ramirez. Y'all remember that? He got away with it for a long time. And he had numerous victims, but he finally got caught. He was taken to trial and he was condemned to death. We could give example after example after example of people who have been condemned. But folks, let me tell you something. When we start talking about those who are condemned, we better start with us. Because we were condemned under the law, under sin. We were condemned. We were condemned to what? To death, according to Scripture. The Bible says that nobody is righteous, no matter what. And those who do not accept Jesus Christ are condemned to die. And when he says death, in that sense, he's talking about not only physical death, but spiritual death as well. We were condemned to die. But you know what? That was before Jesus came. Let me tell you something. Jesus came, and when Jesus came into our life, right here, Paul says, good news. There is no condemnation. You are no longer condemned. <coughs> Folks, I don't know about y'all, but I'm happy about that. Amen. I'm happy about it. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I sure didn't earn it. But I'm grateful for it because Jesus came and did what I couldn't do. Amen. He there is therefore now no condemnation. But let me tell you something. He does something else. Not only does he not condemn us, Paul says, but he delivers us from ourselves. You know who my worst enemy is? You're looking at it. My worst enemy is me. I've got that little uh, thing. I, I was just looking through it in my Bible. I hope it's still in there. I hope it hasn't fallen out and I've lost it. But there's a Puritan prayer. I could probably look it up and find it. But you know, there's a Puritan that prayed one time, Lord, defend me from myself. The enemy is within the citadel. In other words, my worst enemy is me. Lord, defend me from myself. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that that's exactly what he does. He defends us from ourselves. He saves us from ourselves because we still have a sinful nature. And he says that God comes in, not only does he not condemn us, but he saves us from ourselves. He delivers us from sin's penalty when we are saved. You know, the penalty of sin is death. And he says, but you're not condemned anymore, so you're not under that penalty. But then he sends the Holy Spirit with his power to save us from ourselves and to save us from sin's power. Folks, I don't know about you, but I'm happy about that one too. Because I'm my own worst enemy. I know me. You know what? I get thinking about something sometimes that maybe 
you know, got, got next to my last nerve of, uh, some time back, you know, it could have been something that happened a long time ago. I get thinking about it, and I go, man, golly, and it just makes me mad all over again, you know? And then all of a sudden I think, why am I worried about that? That's over with. That's done. I don't have to worry about that anymore because I have been delivered. But you know what? The next thing I think is that, boy, I thought I was over this. I thought I had changed. And guess what? Boy, sometimes that old sinful nature comes right back. Aren't you glad God helps us with that? Aren't you glad that God delivers us from ourselves? There's something else he does for us right here. He, he adopts us. He adopts us. He says you are no longer slaves to sin. Because that's what we were, folks. We're slaves to sin. We have a new standing before God. Instead of seeing a slave, he now sees his child. Stop and think about that. What would you do for your children? What would you do for your children? <laughs> if you're like me, anything within your power. You would do anything within your power for your children. Okay? There's nothing you wouldn't do for them. And folks, God says, look, if you being sinful human parents know how to give good gifts and do good things for your children, how much more do I know how to do for you? Folks, do you understand what it means for God to adopt you and say, you are now my child? That means you have access to everything that's God's. And the last time I checked, God owned it all. Ever been. It's all His. Folks, we have a new standing. We're not slaves anymore. We're children. But here's, here's where it starts getting good to me, folks. I mean, it's been good already, but here's where it starts getting good to me. He sends us the Holy Spirit. Do you ever stop and think about the Holy Spirit? We talk about God a lot. We talk about Jesus a lot, but have you ever stopped and think about the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit does for you? He sends the Holy Spirit to empower you. All that we have is what He has. And He has it all. Okay? We have hope. We have hope. The Holy Spirit assures us that we have salvation because we have Him in our life. Look, when, when we become saved, Christ sends the Holy Spirit to indwell us. And so when we feel the Spirit within us, we know that we're saved, okay? Because we have the Holy Spirit. And He intercedes for us. Have you ever thought about intercession? What is that? Let me tell you what it is. Well, I'm going to give you an example. Maybe it'll, it, this is the best way to explain it. Has there ever been a time in your life when you knew you needed to pray, you just didn't know how to pray? You didn't really know what to pray for? You know what? That's frustrating, isn't it? We've all been there. There are times when we know we need, we need to cry out to God. We feel ne uh, by necessity that we need to, to call out to God and pray to God. But somehow we don't know what to ask for. You know, we overthink things sometimes. Sometimes we think, well, you know what? I don't really need to ask God for that because it might seem like I'm doing this. But on the other hand, I really need to ask Him this and for this because this would, you know, help Him here. And we just don't know what to ask. Here's the time that it really hits us when we've got a loved one laying there suffering in a bed. God, do we want you to take them or do, you, or do we want you to let them stay here? You know what? It's hard for us to let go. We need to stop thinking about us and start thinking about them. And that's hard. That's hard. When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit hears our heart and goes to God and lets God know what we're trying to say but can't. You ever met somebody that was a lot more articulate than you? You know, there are some people that I just wish, Lord, why? Hmm. I wish I could do that. I wish I could come up with that many ideas. I wish I could be that articulate. I wish I could have that kind of presence when I was preaching or talking to people or whatever. I wish I could do this, but 
I'm going to tell you something. God uses all of us. And the Holy Spirit can work through anybody. And I wish I were more articulate. And I wish a lot of times I knew how to pray. But sometimes I don't. And guess what? I'm thankful that God sends us His Holy Spirit so He can hear the cry of my heart and go to God and say, Lord, this is what He's trying to say. And guess what? God hears that. And God knows that. And God honors that. Folks, are you glad that He gives us the Holy Spirit? He knows the cries of our heart. But he gives us hope. All that we have, he has. God has everything. Everything that God has, we have. We are sharing in the life of Christ. That's what the Bible says. And because of that, we have hope. Okay? We share. And, and everything that he experiences, we experience. And what we experience, he experiences. But now let me tell you something. Be careful here. Because when we start talking about experiences, what kind of experiences are there? You know, not all experiences are good, are they? What did Christ say? Christ said, look, you want to be my disciple? The first thing you got to do is take up the cross. And you know what the cross means? It means sacrifice. It means death to self. It's not always easy. Christ said, you want to share in my experiences? Then you have to share in the sufferings as well. Folks, we may be, may be in for days ahead where we see Christians suffering in this country for the cause of Christ. If they had their way about it right now, that's what would already be happening. You know, and people say, well, they just, they just want to wipe out all religion. No, they don't. They want to wipe out Christianity. That's the only one. You know why? Because that's the only one that stands in the way of their agenda. And the reason it's the only one is because it's the Word of God. People say, well, how do you know Christianity is true? How do, why, how do you know that all these other religions ain't true? Oh, really? Well, let me tell you something. If Satan was really worried about them, there'd be an all-out war on all religions, but there's not. There's an all-out war on Christianity. That tells me right there. That's proof positive to me that it is the only true religion. It's the only true faith. You know why? Because it comes from a living God who is still alive and still reigning on the throne. That's what it tells me. Folks, let me tell you something. We have hope even if we are suffering. We may have to suffer, but listen to verse 18 in chapter 8. I like this right here. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, talking to us, folks, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let me tell you something, it don't matter what we go to, it don't compare to what we headed for. I am happy about that. Folks, let me tell you something, this might just be the greatest chapter in the book. I don't know, but it might be because it gives us hope. It gives us no condemnation. We don't have to worry about being condemned to die spiritually and physically. There's no separation from God. We don't have to worry about being separated from our Savior, okay? And there's no defeat because we have the Holy Spirit. And it's all based on God's character. He says that right here. Have you ever stopped to think about the character of God? You know what I think about? Undying, unchanging, infinite love. That's what I think about when I think about God. Because He is my Savior. He loves me. I know He loves me. And I love Him. That's what I think about when I think about God. You start to think about God's purpose. What, what, what is his whole purpose? Well, maybe our salvation? Yeah. <laughs> his purpose toward us is, number one, our salvation. Uh, number two, his foreknowledge of us. He knew. Let me tell you something. Before the world was ever created, God knew my name. He knew my name. I, that blows my mind. It breaks my heart, too. It humbles me. <laughs> But listen, even before the world was ever created, God knew my name. God knew when I would be born. God knew what I'd look like. God knew everything about me, even then. And he knew that one day I would ask him to be my Savior. He knew a long time before I did that I'd be standing here today. <laughs> he knew everything. 
Folks, aren't you glad that God knows you that way? You might think you know somebody. You know, I, I talk to people who want to get married, most of the time younger, younger people. I started to say youngers. You know, I look at them nowadays and they really are. Uh, they want to get married. Oh, yeah, I know them. I, we've been dating for two and a half years. I know them better than anybody. I've been thinking, oh, you don't. No, you don't. And y'all know what I'm talking about. God knows us. God knows us so well. He knows what we need most in our lives. Folks, let me tell you something. You look at God's purpose. His purpose is our salvation. He knew us. He chose us, folks. He chose us. And I'm not talking about predestination. You know what? He chose us when we asked Him. He called to us. We responded. He chose us. He calls to us. He justifies us. We're justified in our existence because of his sacrifice. And he's going to glorify us. That's why he says right there in verse 18 that the suffering of this world are nothing compared to the glory that we're going to see in us. It's not just His glory, it says in us. We're gonna, people are going to be able to see the glory of God in us. Can they see God's glory in you when you're out there in the world? Boy, there's one that... Folks, maybe we need to start thinking about that. Maybe we need to start thinking about that. But then there we get to these unanswerable questions. I love these questions. Look at verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? Man, we're going to go through chapter 8. This will, this will, you'll really understand what I'm talking about when we start going through this. Look. What shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I like that question. Folks, let me tell you something. We might have to go through some suffering, but keep this in mind. God is with us. And God wins. Amen. God's undefeated. You remember that song that uh, the cathedral sang? He's the all-time, undisputed, undefeated champion of love. I like it. I like it. Folks, let me tell you something. He's undefeated. He'll never be defeated. Satan thinks he's going to win, but he won't. There may be a time in our lives when we have to suffer as Christians. And we, we may think that we're defeated, but we're not, folks. We've got to keep it in mind that we serve a God, a God who is on our side, and a God who's never lost and will never lose. Amen. Folks, let me tell you something. He asked this question right here. It's really more of a, a rhetorical question. It's like, if God's for us, who can be against us? Nobody, folks. But look at verse 32. It gets better. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? <laughs> now, when he says all things, what's he talking about? Let me tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about power. He's talking about victory. He's talking about giving us all those things that he has, that he possesses. Folks, we don't have to worry about defeat because... We have him. I love these questions. He says, if he gave us Jesus, his only son, will he hold anything back from us? No, he won't. He won't. But look at verse 33. <laughs> Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You know what he's saying there? Who can bring a charge against us? You know what? Satan will trump something up. He might bring something against Christians. But it won't be a charge that is going to change our status with God. Amen. This will be something that's just man-made. And guess what? God's ways are far higher than man's ways. He says nobody can bring a charge against us. Let me tell you something. If you think about this, one of these days we're all going to stand before God. We're all going to stand before God.
I already know and I'm thankful that when I stand before God, nobody will be able to bring any kind of authority against me. <coughs> nobody. You know why? Because of what Jesus did. Because of the sacrifice that he made. Nobody can bring a charge against me. Oh, I love this. Look at verse 34. <clears throat> Who is he that condemns? Remember what he said in verse 1? There is therefore now no condemnation. God, who's going to condemn you? Nobody. Nobody. And I like verse 35. Listen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know what the character of God is? Unfailing, undying. Love. Right here, Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Nobody. Nobody. These are questions that can't be answered. Nobody will have an answer to these questions because it's God that's asking them and God's already worked it out to where nobody can bring anything against us. Paul goes on in some of the greatest verses of Scripture. Verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he starts listing stuff. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution? Y'all keep this verse in mind, folks. We're getting down to the last days. I honestly believe it. And you know what? People say, well, are you a pre-trib, a-trib, or post-trib? Let me tell you something. Yeah, I, I'm a pre-trib. I think that way. Pre-tribulation. -pre I think the rapture's going to happen. But that doesn't mean we might not have to go through the hard times before it happens. Before it happens. That don't mean we might not have to go through some persecution. Let me tell you something. Do you fear it or do you welcome it? Let me tell you something. If you're a child of Christ, you ought to, you ought to welcome uh, sharing in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. You, you need to keep this verse in mind. Because Paul says, what shall separate us from the love of God? He said, tribulation, distress, and persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now those two verses don't sound real good, do they? Because it sounds like Christians might have to go through some bad stuff, but the good part's coming in the next verse, in verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors because there's no condemnation. There's no separation and there is no defeat. There is no defeat for I am persuaded. I like this. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh. Folks, let me tell you something. Romans 8 may be the best. It may be. Right now, I'd have to say it is because that's what I'm working on. <laughs> Y'all know who Philip Yancey is? Philip Yancey is an author. Uh, he was the editor, I don't know if he still is, of uh, Christianity Today publication. Very intelligent man, written a bunch of books, and I love his books, but he wrote a book several years ago called Disappointment with God. And when I when I read that title, I thought, hmm, Disappointment with God. How can anybody be disappointed with God? But he wrote this book based on counseling sessions he had done with young Christians who had come in and they were having trouble in their faith, <laughs> I guess you could say. And so he narrowed these troubles down after counseling with all these young Christians and he said that they had three complaints basically. Number one is that God's not fair. Praise God. Amen. Fair sends us all to hell. <clears throat> Every one of us. Thank God he's not fair. Thank God he thinks past that. 
but their complaints were God's not fair, God is hidden, he doesn't speak, and God is silent. Those were their three complaints. And I got thinking about this. Wait a minute. Disappointment with God in these three complaints. I, how can you be disappointed with God when he sent his own son to die for you? How can you be disappointed with God when he sends us the Holy Spirit to help us in, uh, talk to God so that God understands the cries of our heart? How can you be disappointed? How can you be disappointed when he has adopted you and given you all the riches of heaven and eternity? How can you be disappointed with him when he loves you and the Bible says that there's nothing that can separate that love from you? How can you be disappointed with God? Folks, you know what? I'm not so naive to think there might not be folks here today, and I know that there are people today that say that they're disappointed with God. May I offer a suggestion? If you're disappointed with God, maybe it's just because you're upset that he didn't do exactly what you wanted when you wanted or how. And I can tell you how to cure a disappointment with God. Get your eyes off yourself and get them on God. Amen. That's how to cure a disappointment with God. Folks, let me tell you something. I read Romans 8. I can't find a reason to be disappointed with God. I can't do it. I can't do it. Because of what he has done for me. Folks, let me tell you something. It might be the best. Because it says that there is no condemnation. Father, thank you. We praise you, Heavenly Father, that there is no condemnation, that there is no separation, and there is no defeat when we ask you to come into our heart and our life. Heavenly Father, I praise you today that you are a God of undying, unchanging love. And that nothing can separate us from that love. Father, I praise you this morning for that. Lord, I pray that we might be faithful to you to the end. I pray that we might take very seriously the fact that we may have to suffer physically for you. But God, if that day comes, give us strength. And Lord, may we do it with joy because you suffered for us. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here today that doesn't know what we're talking about, Father, they haven't accepted you, I pray that you would just speak to them. Touch their heart, Heavenly Father, and bring them to the foot of the cross where they might receive the love that we as Christians know. Father, maybe there are Christians here who have gotten their eyes off of you and put their eyes back on themselves. Lord, I pray that you would convict them today that they just need to get their eyes on you. Father, whatever you're willing to do, we pray that it would be done today for us in your name. You can have him of invitation. If God is speaking, you come.